you agree. So I want to give you a review. It's been a couple of weeks as we have been looking at all of the post-resurrection appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ, which has, by the way, shocker, has given me some ideas of future studies that we want to do uh, in our Wednesday night stay, which I'm just excited about as well. I'm at least two years ahead on where I want to go in our Wednesday night study. So uh, as a review, uh, we started, of course, on Wednesday of the Passion Week. And remember, uh, we began with Joseph burying the body. And then after that, the women of Galilee were watching where Joseph placed the body. And then we learned that Nicodemus and his servants came to anoint the body, which the women didn't know about. And then on Thursday, the only thing that we have recorded in the Scripture that day was that the Pharisees and the chief priests uh, requested a guard uh, at the tomb because they thought that maybe the disciples would steal the body and claim that He had risen from the dead. And then Friday, if you'll remember, that will be the first chance that the women would get because, remember, Thursday was a special day, a high day, a day of preparation uh, because of the uh, Passover week, the women brought, or I'm sorry, bought and prepared the spices. They didn't bring it yet. There's a difference between bought and brought. Amen. And then on that Saturday, they we know that they rested on the Sabbath. That was the second Sabbath of the week, which again throws everybody off on the three days and three nights. But why wouldn't it? We're Gentiles, not Jews. Okay. And then on Saturday, Sunday, right? Our Saturday, their Sunday, you know how that is. Jesus was raised from the dead, and the women came to see the tomb, and uh, we learned about all of that. And then Sunday, many things taking place. We had a great earthquake. We had Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb. Then Peter and John came to the tomb. Then Mary had an encounter with the two angels, and remember, they were seated, one at the head, one at the foot, where Jesus' body was. Then she stepped out of the tomb and had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, remember Mary then goes and tells the disciples. And then the rest of the women came later without Mary to the tomb. And the women encountered an angel. And then after they encountered the angel, then they encountered two more angels deeper inside the tomb. And then the women go to tell the disciples. And then on their way to to tell the disciples, the women encounter the Lord Jesus. And then the women go and tell the disciples. And then Peter, when he hears this, he goes to the tomb. And then we know that Jesus then appeared to two on the road to Emmaus, a Cleopas and an unnamed disciple. And then they knew that Jesus had appeared to Peter when he went separately than the rest of the disciples. And so that's where we are so far. Everybody with me? All right. So let's then go to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, we have just finished with the two on the road to Emmaus. We know that he had already appeared to uh, Cephas as we uh, learned. But once again, you have to understand, neither believed they them. Over and over again. Remember, the Lord Jesus gave many infallible proofs. Acts chapter 1 tells us. Many infallible proofs. And the people that kept encountering Jesus would go and tell people, and they would still not believe. Over and over we see that. We always say, well, if we just saw Jesus, then I guarantee you what, what it's not true. Peter said we have a more sure word of prophecy when we have the written Scriptures. And this is the same Peter who heard the audible voice of God on the Mount of Transfiguration. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Over and over, they they didn't believe. Doesn't matter how many times Jesus showed Himself. And so now, we're still in Sunday. Busy day on Sunday. And so we're still in the 18th of Nisan. Jesus now appears to the apostles and the disciples, as they were gathered together behind locked doors. This was the first time now, with all the events that we just made reference to, that He appears to the disciples as a group. Minus one disciple. Who was He? Not Judas. He's already dead. I'm not talking about that disciple. He's gone. Thomas. Thomas. Thomas was not with them. 
Remember, Jesus had already appeared to the women. He had already appeared to Peter. He had already appeared to Cleopas and the unnamed disciple on the road to Emmaus. And so now all these people were, were and more were present when Jesus appeared in the room. All of them. He appeared in the midst of a locked room. That's why it startled the disciples. And so the Bible says that He said unto them, Peace be unto you. They thought they were seeing a ghost, a spirit. But He corrected them and told them, Well, does a spirit have flesh and bones? Now, isn't that something? It gives us some insight into the resurrected body. That it is flesh and bones, but not blood. Just like Adam and Eve, prior to their fall, they had flesh and bones. Thou art flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Didn't say flesh and blood. They didn't have blood until they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Clearly in the Scriptures. So he then shows them his scars, just like Jonah had when he walked through Nineveh of his death. And then he reproves them for not believing all the people that he appeared to, and they said, he is alive. He reproves them. Let's look at it. Mark 16, 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and abraded them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Now Jesus, if you'll remember, had just taught through the Scriptures about himself to the two on the road to Emmaus, Cleopas and that other disciple. And remember they said, did not our heart burn within us while he spoke to us, those things? And so now, here in Luke chapter 24, he begins to expound through the Scriptures that he was the promised, chosen Son of God. He gives them not only a scriptural evidence, but an experimental evidence. Evidence, In other words, personal experience with the disciples themselves, which would, should give them reason to believe that He was indeed alive. Notice in Luke chapter 24 and verse 36. And as they thus spake, the people that were telling, remember the two on the road race and made it back to these, these folks, Jesus Himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, why are ye troubled? What is, what is wrong with you? <laughs> right? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. We know that this has to be after the time that he offered himself upon the holy temple mercy seat in heaven because He invites them to touch Him. Whereas He told Mary, don't touch me. So here He says, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Well, you already offered His blood. So He doesn't have blood. And when He had thus spoken, He showed them His hands and His feet. Well, what would, he, what would they see? Well, they would see nail holes through His hand and His feet. Wow. And while they yet believed not for joy, what does that mean? They, they were rejoicing. And wondered, he said to them, Have ye here any meat? Here's some new insight into our resurrected body. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb. We're going to get to eat sweets in our resurrected body. Man. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. I love it when the living word speaks of the written word. He divides the Old Testament into three sections. The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Isn't that fun? Concerning me. But look at verse 45. Then opened he their understanding. Translation. 
Before this moment, they didn't understand. So anybody tells you that the gospel that was being preached in the gospels was the same gospel that we preach today, take them right here. Because the disciples up until Luke chapter 24 did not understand the death, burial, and resurrection. Big difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God. We must rightly divide the word of truth. Y'all with me? Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So now they understand. Look at John chapter 20's account. Look at verse number 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Let me say this right here. After this, we see an incredible change that takes place in the life of the disciples. Same disciples that had the fear of the Jews here in John chapter 20. Just a couple of chapters later in Acts chapter 2, these were the same that stood before the very same council that crucified the Lord Jesus Christ and preached Christ unto them. The only thing that we can account for the change that took place in these disciples' life where, where they're held up in a do- inside a room with a locked door, scared to death for fear of the Jews, And then just a little bit later now, they're preaching and say we ought to obey God rather than men and and, and, and rejoice because they were counted worthy to suffer for His name is that they had an encounter with the resurrected Savior. It's the only thing we know. And so, I'm not going to preach, sorry. Let me get back to teaching. Came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when He had so said, He showed unto them His hands and His side. Well, it's a contradiction because the other account says he showed him his hands and feet. Well, no, the Gospels work together, right? John includes the fact they showed him his side too. It was pierced. Pierced. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, that's a weird deal, isn't it? By the way, this is not what took place in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost to indwell the body of Christ eternally. Okay, What is happening here? Well, we just read in our previous accounts that the disciples did not believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ yet. And so, you know what has happened? The same thing that happened in the Old Testament. When David prayed, what did he pray? He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from Thy presence, O Lord. Take not Thy Holy Spirit from me. In the Old Testament, when you grieve the Holy Spirit, He could leave you. Right? Not in the New Testament. And so here... They had grieved the Holy Spirit by not believing in the witness of the Spirit concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. So they received the Holy Ghost again, just like they did in the Old Testament. The Holy Ghost would come and go. How about this? How about Saul? When the Holy Ghost left him, the Lord replaced the Holy Ghost with an evil spirit. How about that? Aren't you thankful that you live under the dispensation of the grace of God? We're covering a lot of things here, I know. Whosoever, uh, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. Now the Roman Catholic institution steals this from the disciples to apply it to a priest right? that can forgive you of your sins. It's not what's happening here. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Look at verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. I don't know where he was, but he wasn't there. Okay? Now what happens is Jesus appears to all these as He has appeared many times to everyone else. Thomas comes in for whatever he was doing and he does not believe. Did you hear what I said? You've got all of the apostles there. 
minus Judas, he's, he's gone, right? You've got the two on the road to Emmaus, you got the women, you got all the other disciples. They're all telling him, we just saw the risen Savior. And you wonder why people don't believe in the resurrection of Christ today. Isn't that something? So look at verse number 25. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said, You're all liars. That's what he's saying. He says, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails. Now that's an interesting statement. Have you ever wondered why he said both? Well, because he will immediately think that it's just a spirit. And you can press right through a spirit. Right? But you can feel flesh and bone. Isn't that something? And if he was nailed in his hands, then you could literally, if you put your hand into the hole, feel bone. That's what he's saying here. So he says, and put my finger into the print of the nail. That's quite a thing to ask of somebody, isn't it? And thrust my hand into his side. Well, what is he going to do? Feel around for a liver? What is he doing? I will not believe. Great practical uh, application of that, folks, is that people will try any excuse they can to not believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Well, now we know we're... That's all from Sunday. We know that the next day, so we would say Monday, the 26th of the sun, the Lord appears a second time in a locked room with all the disciples, including Thomas now. So this is after eight days. So since the counting of days can, uh, includes the starting day, the eighth day would have to have been um, the Sunday, and then the day after would be Monday. That's where we come up with that. So in John chapter 20 and verse number 26, and after eight days, again his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Now isn't that something? Flesh and blood can walk through doors and walls in the resurrection. Now I don't know if there's a verse that tells us when we'll use that. But boy, that sure will be fun. Because, you know, we will rule as kings and priests during the millennial reign with people who do not have resurrected bodies. I don't know if we'll ever be given that liberty to use that great talent, but I would really enjoy that. <laughs> or would. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with him. Then, then came the, Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. And then saith he to Thomas, I wonder what the disciples are doing right now. I wonder if they're all just kind of smiling. You know, I'm sure that they're all just rejoicing to see Jesus. But I wonder if some of them are just kind of looking over at Thomas like, you know, that's what, that's what I would do. I'm not saying I'm right. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger, behold my hand. And reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. What we're about to read is one of the greatest things that we in 2022 will ever read in the Scriptures concerning us. Thomas, we don't have any record that Thomas needed to put his hands in the holes of Jesus' hands or thrust his fist into the side of the Lord Jesus. Because immediately Thomas says this, My Lord and my God. I'm thankful Thomas got it. Yeah? Isn't it sad that Thomas is known for his doubt? Whereas Thomas was the first disciple to say, we'll be willing to give our lives for Jesus. But nobody ever knows Thomas for that. Did you know that? He said it first. We'll give our life for you. We're going to go down and die. But we know him for his doubting. Do you understand and know that the world is not going to judge your faith and your testimony by all the good that you do? They can't wait for you to slip up. 
and they'll use it against you. And they'll weigh it in the balance and they'll use the negative, the one negative, the one slip up that you did, rather than all of the times that you follow God with your life. Just know that, that that's what they're looking for. That's what they know Thomas. When you read about Thomas's life, he did a lot of things right before he ever did this. But he says, my Lord and my God. Look at verse 29. I love this verse because it's talking about us. You know why I know? Because look what it says. Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and have yet believed. You say, well, if I just saw him, you would doubt just as much, if not more, as if you had never seen him. How do you know? Because every single other person did. Isn't that something? So don't ever wish you were born in a different time. Jesus said, blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. You ever hear that phrase, seeing is believing? Ask the disciples that. Right? So then we go from there. So that we have this experience with Thomas. All right, great. Everybody's good. Everybody now has seen the resurrected Savior. Well, he tells them then to go to Galilee. Now we find this in the text. Let's look at Matthew 28. Look at verse number 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him. Well, now I want you to look at this. But some doubted. Isn't that something? Now they go to Galilee, evidently waiting for Jesus to appear as He promised in the message delivered by the women. If you remember, go into Galilee. And so this is that, that moment. John chapter 21 gives us an account that none of the other Gospels give us. Let's look at a little bit of it. I don't know if that's in our notes, Sammy, but let's look at a little bit. If we can go to John 21, you can also use your Bibles, I suppose. Amen. We find this experience in John 21 of Peter and six others. They decide to go fishing. Remember, Peter still has an issue, doesn't he? He has, he has denied the Lord three times. So he goes fishing. I think at this point in Peter's life, we, we, we know that he saw the Lord, but Peter is not right yet. So he goes fishing. I, I believe Peter was frustrated. I believe Peter was angry. I believe Peter in his life, all he did was mess up. And so I believe that he did and the only thing that he knew he was good at. Or at least he thought he did. And he went fishing. But here's a shocker. He caught nothing. Even the things we think we're good at, we're not very good at. And so he goes fishing. And notice, look at verse number 5. Then, said, then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? And they answered him, No. I just, I just love that. Nope, caught nothing. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. Well, you got to go to the right side, amen, not the wrong side. Oh, I hate spiritualizing the text. They cast, therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, who is that? Well, that's John, saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. And then when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked. And did cast himself into the sea. And you know, I've never tried to fish that way. I, you know what my theory is? I'm telling you, that's the reason why he couldn't catch anything. Amen? Fish are not going to come anywhere near that. Amen? That's just... I'm sorry. And yeah. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw a coal of fires there. So here Jesus is making a fire. He says, uh, bring the fish which you have now caught. What you, that, that famous hymn we all sing, come and dine. And so they dine with the Lord in His resurrected body. Notice verse number 14. Now, this is the third time that Jesus showed Himself to His disciples. We, we just read the previous two. 
And so now we find something that no other gospel talks about, this experience where I believe Peter finally gets right with the Lord and his life has changed forever. So then when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Peter, verse 15, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? You ever ask your kids the same question more than once? Sure. Sure. You're making a point, aren't you? Well, so is Jesus. Yea, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to them, feed my sheep. He said to him again the third time. And this is where I think it struck Peter. You tell your, you tell your kids the same thing, and then they get it. The light comes on. I think it came on with Peter. Why Jesus asked him? No, no, no. It didn't have anything to do with the different Greek words that have been preached so much, agape versus phileo, because agape and phileo, uh, the two, two different words for love, are used interchangeably in every context imaginable in the New Testament. So why, what was he saying here? Well, the reason he asked him if he loved him three times was because he denied him three times. That's why. That's why we find that Peter was grieved when he said it the third time. It's like, oh yeah, got it. It's kind of like when Peter heard the rooster crow. Do you remember? The Bible says that he, he looked out the window and Jesus, out there in the, uh, as, as Jesus was in the house, Peter was out there in the court after he had denied him, the rooster crowed. The Bible says they locked eyes. The Bible says Peter went out and wept bitterly. So this is what's happening. It's all coming back to him right here. He was grieved, and he said, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Wow, you know that I love you. I messed up. I love you. He said, feed my sheep. And then he gives him insight into the fact that Peter will one day die in much of the same way that Jesus did. He said, you know, right now you're able to go wherever you want, but somebody is going to carry you, and you'll be stuck. Look at what he says. When thou was young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands. What, what do you think punishment is going on here? Well, he's going to be crucified. And another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Tradition says that Peter indeed was crucified. Tradition says that he did not feel worthy to be crucified in the same way that Jesus was. And tradition says that he asked to be crucified upside down. And he was. Isn't that something? So, all of this is going on right here. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. That conversation, and then he tells Peter of his future martyrdom. He said this was three times now, three times, that he had showed himself to his disciples that he had risen from the dead. Remember the first meeting, the 11 minus Thomas. The second meeting was with Thomas was present, and this is the third time. And I love this. Peter said, okay, I'm going to be crucified. Well, what's he going to do? Talk about John. You know, and look at this, what he says. If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then won't you, don't you worry about what I've got in store for John. And you know what's an amazing thing? He's given a prophecy concerning John's future. Because John was sent to the Isle of Patmos. And he saw Jesus in all of his future glory. So he did tarry till Jesus come. Isn't that something? He gave him in Revelation chapter 4 a picture of the rapture of the body of Christ. So John did tarry till Jesus came. Wow, isn't that amazing? All right. So the appearance on the appointed mountain in Galilee takes place sometime after John 21, this experience with Peter and John and this conversation. So in Matthew, we quickly see the narrative of what's taking place logically. Since a few verses earlier in Matthew's gospel, Jesus had told the women to tell his brethren that they'd see him in Galilee. So that's why that's not included there. So after, in, back in, in, if we go back to, to Matthew 28, we find a little parenthetical there. 
Remember verse 10, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. Remember the parenthetical right there is when the Jewish leaders paid off the guards to say the disciples stole the money, or stole the body for money. And then, verse 16, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Okay, so that's, that's why we find that there. So this is where many believe, as I do, my opinion, that this is where Jesus appeared to uh, over 500 people at once. This is what Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's look at it. Of all the evidences, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Remember verse number 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. We've already studied that. After that, he was seen above of above 500 brethren at once. Now, this is what I love. Paul has no problem saying this. If you don't believe me, go ask the over 500 witnesses to the bodily resurrection of Christ. I'd say that's pretty strong evidence. Just go ask them. They'll all tell you the same thing. Look at this of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. You could ask him. You could ask him of this experience. If Paul was making that up, do you think that he would say, go ask any of these witnesses. They're alive. So, Ma Mar uh, I'm sorry, Matthew's gospel doesn't specifically say that the others were present with the disciples, but nothing in the verse would, pr would uh, uh, preclude that. So seeing Jesus there, the Bible says, some, this is why I believe there were over 500. Because the 11 at this time had all seen, even doubting Thomas, and they all said, my Lord, my God. And so now, Matthew 28, the reason why I believe there was, there's over 500 is because I believe that by this time, the 11 would have this all settled. But the Bible says, verse 17, but when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. I would, I would contend that's not some of the 11, that's some of the 500. That makes natural sense to me, likely. So let's talk about the last appearances of the Lord on this earth. Paul brings out another instance that is not found in the Gospels. It's really fun. Look at verse number uh, 7 of 1 Corinthians 15. After that, he was seen of James. James. Well, who would be James right here? Well, no, he's not the James of the disciples. Who is another James that we would all know here? The half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. The half-brother. Now, we can't be sure of the place of this meeting, I believe it's very possible it could be in Galilee because that's where Jesus was from and that's where James was from. Okay, That's where they grew up. That's where we meet James in the narrative of the Gospels in the first place. Whenever this occurred, this had to be a catalyst for James. Why? Because Jesus' half-brother did not believe in Jesus in the beginning. The Bible says in John chapter 7, verse number 5, for neither did his brethren believe in him. I believe that by the time of Jesus' earthly ministry at around 30 years of age, that Joseph, the husband of Mary, had already passed away, had already died. But Mary and Joseph, in spite of what many teach you scripturally, had sons and daughters after the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. James was one of them. And so Jesus in His resurrected body now appears to His half-brother to prove that He is exactly who He said He was. Notice here in the text, after that He was seen of James, then, so there's another instance, of all the apostles. One more time. Well, when did that take place? Well, let's look at it. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, look at verse number 19, uh, 14. Afterward, 
He appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and abraded them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen them after He was risen. And He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In My name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, He was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. These many infallible proofs. Some, I was like, where am I? I was in Luke. It wasn't working. Look at what it says. Being, uh, verse number 3, To whom also He showed Himself alive after His passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so this was some of what we find in Mark's gospel and in Luke's gospel. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Acts chapter 2. So that when he, Remember when he breathed on them the Holy Ghost? That's not the same thing as what's going to be taken. He said, wait for this. So we know that was still future. When they were come together, remember the, the disciples still didn't really understand the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God? Are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? He said, no, it's not for you to know that. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That's what you need to wait for. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and unto Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, right? Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Well, that's happened before. Remember with the women at the tomb? Which said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Wow. So Jesus led the apostles as far as Bethany on the east side of the Mount of Olives near Jerusalem. He gave them their final instructions before He ascended into heaven. And then He was seen one more time, which you know, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and last of all, Last of all, he was seen by me also as of one born out of due time. When did that take place? Acts chapter 9. Remember he was going to Damascus to persecute the church. And as he journeyed, verse number 3, he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? I like when people say, I can have a relationship with Jesus without going to church. Well, the Bible says in Acts chapter 8 that Paul was persecuting the church. Jesus said, you're persecuting me when you persecute the church. I'd say church is important. And he said, who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He said, you're only hurting yourself. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And, and the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So we, as we have shown in, in the past three weeks, which I thought was only going to be a one-week lesson, there are absolutely no contradictions in the accounts of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. All we had to do was examine all the eyewitness accounts recorded in God's Word realize by faith that for Scripture to be reliable, they must all be true. And then see how they just fit together without any contrivances. And that's what we have done. So together, these accounts tell us about the most important 
truth in the history of the world, and this is it. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for our sins and rose bodily from the grave, conquering sin and death for our salvation for the glory of God. And those who did not see Him like us have also been called to believe on Him and are promised the incredible blessing of eternal life for that belief. I like what Peter of all people said. He said in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 8, Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see Him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Isn't that wonderful? Man, I hope that you've enjoyed that three-week study. When I get back, we'll have Baptist History Night, and then...